Well, welcome to Unemployment Part 2. It's now getting really exciting because we're going to look at the causes and the types of unemployment, uh, which is um, very important for AS level economics. Um, and so there are four main causes stroke types of unemployment. Frictional, structural, classical and cyclical. Let's take them in turn. Frictional unemployment is really when people are between jobs, hence the term transitional unemployment. And we assume that someone's frictionally unemployed, uh, but a vacancy actually exists. It's just a question of time before they find and fill that vacancy um, as a matter of searching the job market. Uh, at any one time in the UK, recently, there have been 500,000 to 700,000 unfilled vacancies in the labour market. And it's simply because of the time required to fill those vacancies that we have frictional unemployment. Let's say someone like Richard. Richard is, say, an IT director. He resigns and leaves one job, and then enters the labour market um, and is classified as unemployed, whilst he's looking for another job. And he finds another vacancy within a few months, and of course his happy man gets another job, perhaps with a bit of a bonus, more pay, more responsibility. And so this flux in the labour market is really a good thing because it's part of a dynamic economy. Now the second type of unemployment is the structural unemployment. This is when there's a mismatch between the skills that um, the labour force has and the um, skills that employers are looking for. Or there's a mismatch between the location of workers and the location of the potential employment. So. Um, there's really two key areas here. There's a loss of jobs in industries that are closing, for example, in the UK. We've had sunset industries such as coal mining, shipbuilding, iron and steel, metalworking, textiles. And many jobs have moved from the UK to places such as South America, such as in shipbuilding. We've had the loss of shipbuilding industries on Tyneside and Clydeside. And those jobs have gone abroad to other countries to lower cost centres of production. This is part of globalisation um, and of course it's a cost of globalisation. So, so we're left with this problem of structural unemployment. And what we need, really need is those people to retrain or relocate um, and then they'll, they'll get another job. But of course we have the problem of uh, occupational immobility and geographical immobility which means that structural unemployment often persists. Uh, another cause is perhaps new technology. So workers are replaced with new technology, such as print workers or car workers are replaced with robots. And if we think of um, new technology, it means that those skills are no longer in demand, they're outdated, and we need reskilling or retraining as a solution to this sort of structural unemployment. So we take Jim, uh, say Jim is a coal miner in the northeast of England, and he says, Oh, yeah, no, no. this is like really un unfortunate because he loses his job as a coal miner uh, because the coal mines close, and unless he retrains, reskills, or um, moves location, he's not going to find a job particularly easily. Um, and so, this is the problem with structural unemployment. Um, and we'll look at the solutions shortly. A third type of unemployment is classical unemployment, often known as real wage unemployment. And this is simply a result of um, the real wage being higher than the market clearing level. So let's look at our simple diagram. This is, say, um, a market for hairdressers, okay? And if at WE, the demand and supply for hairdressers will be equal, we reach an equilibrium at wage WE, and um, that's the quantity um, where there's an equilibrium between the demand and supply of labour. However, if we formed a very strong trade union of hairdressers and they became really militant, demanding more wages, well, look what happens. We basically have a wages floor, okay, and then we have a new supply curve here, which I'm drawing in blue. You could really be drawing it red, but never mind. So they form a militant union, they push up the wages, uh, say to W1, and look what happens. We end up with this excess supply of labour at this point here. So it's now Q1 minus Q2 
q2, q1 minus q2 is the level of unemployment because of the excess supply of labour we have in that industry. So, um, take another example, say Janet is a shop assistant, um, she is not prepared to work, say for £6 an hour, um, because perhaps she receives generous benefits, um, therefore it's not worth her while working for that level. She, she'll only work for the high level, say £8 an hour, in which case that's an example, uh, Janet is an example of classical unemployment or real wage unemployment. So trade unions that are very militant, arguably, uh, benefits that are very generous, or a national minimum wage that is too high can cause classical unemployment. Um, obviously this, this view suits uh, certain political ideologies. Uh, and we come to the, the last type of unemployment, known as cyclical unemployment, also known as Keynesian and demand deficient unemployment, Keynesian because the concept was developed by the great economist John Maynard Keynes. Demand deficient because basically it's a result of aggregate demand being below aggregate supply in the economy. And therefore there's less demand for goods and services. Um, labour of course is a derived demand, so the demand for labour will fall. If firms are to maintain their profitability, therefore what they need to do is to shed labour to have voluntary or indeed involuntary redundancies. Um, that increases unemployment through no, no fault of anyone's. So, for example, if Jane here, she's not looking too happy, works in the building industry, one of the first um, areas to be cut back when there's a recession is indeed the building industry. The construction industry is highly cyclical and follows the cycle of the economy. Uh, Jane loses her job as a builder through no fault of her own and uh, because aggregate demand has fallen and the demand for new buildings has fallen. So, um, the demand deficient unemployment can even occur when not only there's a recession but there's actually a slowdown. So say we have 1% economic growth in real terms, okay, only 1%. Imagine if productivity is growing at 2.5%, then firms again are going to be shedding labour because the productivity is growing faster than the actual uh, economy at 1%. So uh, even when there's a slowdown, you can get cyclical unemployment. Um, now how do you solve unemployment problems? What policies? And the main thing to bear in mind is that frictional, structural and classical are what we call voluntary unemployment. In other words, they're caused by, for example, trade unions or mismatch of skills where people won't retrain or relocate. Or people like Richard have left their job and are looking for another one. So how do we help reduce voluntary unemployment? Basically through supply side policies. So we need policies such as increased information, increased use of IT, better job centres, better uh, provision of skills, more apprenticeships, perhaps more education, um, policies to encourage greater geographical mobility of labour, such as uh, it's easy to buy and sell property or rent property in different parts of the country. Those are all supply-side policies that operate on the labour market. Now, if you've got cyclical unemployment, we'd call that involuntary, and what you need there are demand-side policies, probably a reflationary fiscal and or monetary policy and that will solve the problem of the involuntary unemployment. And so the distinction between voluntary and supply side policies and involuntary demand side policies is a particularly useful one to use when you're writing answers to questions about unemployment. So thank you very much.